Welcome, everyone. We're gathered today on the 13th of January on the Gregorian calendar 2024, which happens to be the second of the 11th month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it. According to everything that's written, the common scriptures, and what was found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, and even the apostolic writings that are not very familiar with everybody. But in the course of our conversations, before we got started, um, we had some very interesting topics come up, and the idea of reading this came to my mind, so I'd really like to share it with you. We might have written, read about this before, but we have a, a pretty decent new batch of fellowship amongst us, and it's always good to recap. So, Irenaeus was a taught one of Polycarp, who in turn was a taught one of Yahukanon, the writer of the Besora, the letters and revelation. Now, many people say that this is Yahukanon, the taught one or the disciple. I'm not going to really get into this right here, but I highly encourage everyone to read his Basora for yourself, just looking for who it is that is the one whom Yahushua loves. Read through that account and see who he loves and who wrote it. And then you, you let me know what you think. But anyways, it says, this is a long chapter, but what treasures for those who cling to the truth? Irenaeus was actually a overseer, or what they call a bishop, if you will, of Lyon, which is in Gaul, or what we call modern-day France. He had gone over there after there was missionary work done by Shaul and Clement, and he was the overseer um, and wrote this book, Against Heresies, which is actually five volumes, around 180 A.D., <clears throat> The um, the history behind it and other things we'll, we can get into some other time. We'll really cover it when we get to this point in history and the chronology of events, Father willing. But for right now, he wrote this as a refutation or an argument to be used by teachers, by ministers and evangelists to help refute the Gnosticism that was prevalent and infecting believers all over the known world there was assemblies that were built by the emissaries and then there was the gnosticism the simonians the marcions the valentinians and the nicolaitans etc that grew up after that and perverted things by teaching and mixing things with truth and lies and amalgamating hellenization if you will or paganism with the truth so his argument or his five books was all about exposing what they actually teach and promote and then refuting it with the word. Very amazing stuff. This particular section is from book three, chapter 11. And it is proofs in continuation extracted from Kadoshi Yahukanon or the set apart Yahukanon's good news, Besora. The Besora are or in number, neither more nor less, the mystic reasons for this, or the, the parable, right? Everything that he does, the truth declared. There's nothing that he doesn't say or do that is in, in parables, okay? Yahukanon, the taught one of Yahuwah, preaches this belief and seeks by proclamation of the Basora, to remove that error by which Serinthus had been disseminated among men, and a long time previously by those termed Nicolaitans. Serinthus was the modern leader of the Nicolaitans in the later part of Yahukanon's life, when he wrote the good news and refutation to that, and then later received revelation where Yahushua declares his hatred for the Nicolaitans, and that was a term that was coined 
from Nicholas, one of the seven disciples or ministers, if you will, of the assembly in Yerushalayim, which again was a parable. Our Mashiach came, who's the light of the world like the sun. He said, he preached the Malkuth Shemaim, or the kingdom of the heavens, if you will, which is like the light of the moon and representative of the earthly kingdom. We cover that in detail in our video on Gad the Seer, chapter 1. And then the stars are the children of light running the course set before them, who knows him who names them and shows forth him who numbers them, which was the emissaries as the 12 constellations setting up the assemblies throughout the world, which would have been like the deacons and the, the minor constellations that help uh, branch out from them. And all of that was the sun, moon, and stars, fourth day representation, right? Nicholas, um, the seven are like the seven wandering stars or planets, but five of them are visible to the naked eye and two are invisible. Stephanos was a martyr and Nicholas went apostate. So those are the two that were no longer visible amongst the assembly, a representation of what is in the Shamayim. Ab willing, that makes more sense to everyone. But that's literally the fulfillment of that. And Serenthus is recorded as the first one to keep December 25th as a venerated day for Nicolaitanism in amalgamating it with the belief. It was later fully culminated amongst the Nicolaitan Catholic Christians by Sixtus the Third, the literal 666 of Revelation, in I believe it was 435. He was made the Bishop of Rome, the 44th or the 40, yeah, the 44th Bishop of Rome in 432 AD. And he died eight years later. I think it was around 435 that he established the Christ Mass on December 25th, the foretold abomination of desolation that was coming from the Nicolaitans. And he says, who are an offset of that knowledge, falsely so-called Gnosticism, right? Or science, that he might confound them and persuade them that there is but one Elohim who made all things by his word. And not as they allege that the creator was one, but the father of Yahuwah another. And that the son of the creator was forsooth one, but the Mashiach from above another. These are the, the Gnostic opinions that he's refuting, just so you're not confused, okay? Who also continued in passable, descending upon Yahushua, the son of the creator, and flew back again into his pleroma. The pleroma is the Gnostic spiritual universe where Elohim dwells in his fullness, which is blasphemous error because the fullness of Elohim cannot be contained by anything other than the completeness of Elohim bodily in our Mashiach. But that's not the Father. The Father, who is without limit, contains all things and in himself is contained by nothing, which is where this error comes into play. And it says, and that monogenous or one beginning, right, was the beginning, but Logos was the true son of monogenous, and that this creation to which we belong was not made by the primary Elohim, but by some power lying far below him, and shut off from the communion with the things invisible and ineffable. The taught one of Yahuwah, therefore, desiring to put an end to all such doctrines and to establish the rule of truth in the assembly or congregation, that there is one El Shaddai, who made all things by his word, both visible and invisible, showing at the same time that by the word, through whom Elohim made the creation, he also bestowed deliverance on the men included in the creation. Thus commenced his teaching in the Besorah. In the beginning was the word, 
and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made. What was made was life in him, and a life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. Yahukanon 1, 1, etc. And just so you know, there is a Vatican manuscript that was released both of part of the beginnings of Luke and Yahukanon here. It was done in an effort to promote a particular pronunciation by those that do not Oh, they openly reject our Mashiach on one hand and um, are in collusion with, collusion with him. But one of the things you find in the version of Yahukanon, a very amazing thing, is that our father, a title for him in there was Hakol, which is seen in Sirach, in the Recognitions of Clement, the Dead Sea Scrolls, in Yahukanon there, and in, I believe, another place where he is literally called the All. There's a few places in the Dead Sea Scrolls that it mentions that. But in Yahukanon, it says that um, that Yahukanon the Immerser was come that he might show them the all through his servant, meaning that they Yahukanon the Immerser was going to show the people Hakol, the Father, through our Mashiach, which is a literal rendering. <clears throat> sorry. A literal rendering of the Hebrew in that section. So I'll make sure to find that and I'll share it with you. I believe I've done it before, but I'll give you the PDF for the manuscripts too if you'd like to look at it. Uh, back on track here. It says, all things, he's, he says, were made by him. Therefore, in all things, this creation of ours is, for we cannot concede to these men that all things are spoken of in reference to those within their pleroma. For if their pleroma do indeed contain these, this creation, as being such, is not outside, as I have demonstrated in the preceding book, but if they are outside the pleroma, which indeed appeared impossible, it follows in that case that their pleroma cannot be all things, and therefore this vast creation is not outside. Yahuchanan, however, does himself put this matter beyond all controversy on our part, when he says, "In or he was in this world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Yahuchanan 1, 10 and 11. Yet, according to Marcion and those like him, neither was the word made by him, or world, rather. And world is different from earth or aretz. Uh, this is like Tival or the habitable land. And the other is just land or ground. Generally, the earth in all its totality. And this is the world and the people and all that fills it for context. <laughs> says, neither was the world made by him, nor did he come into his own things, but to those of another. And according to certain of the Gnostics, this world was made by messengers and not by the word of Elohim. But according to the followers of Valentinus, the world was not made by him, but by the Demiurge. For he, Soter, or Savior, caused such similitudes to be made after the pattern of things above, as they allege. But the Demiurge accomplished the work of creation. For they say that he, the master and creator... Is, I have to interrupt. Yes, ma'am? Is the, is the Demiurge talking about the Gnostic idea? Yes, ma'am. He's explaining Thank things. You. Thank I'm, you. No problem. He's explaining things throughout here at the beginning about the Gnostic beliefs and what they promote, and then he's refuting it with the truth of what we were given. 
So there's sometimes there can be a lot of confusion, most especially in the earlier books, because he's literally going through and explaining every doctrine of error that they hold to. It can be very taxing on the mind. It, it's not meant for everyone, really. But there is nuggets of gold within here that I think everyone should should take heed to. This being one of them. But I'll let you be the judge of that as we go. However, all these things that are that seem unfamiliar to you, Demi Urge, Sotor, what they did, and this is the thing that was peculiar to the Gnostics of the, the Hellenists or the Greeks, if you will. They took the words that were in the scriptures and then they made their own perverted, they spun off into their own doctrines with it. So they kind of added their own opinions to the text to make up things that demons were instigating to them in an effort to turn all of this story, or all of it back to uh, paganism, to kind of connect the things that Satan had done before in muddying up the good news of his coming. Actually, I think it's more important than you think. I think it's going to be part of the great deception that's going to come upon the world where they're going to say that Satan created us or aliens or whatever, and that the Demurge was actually an alien. So yeah. I think it's a little more important than you think, because I've read the doctrine. It says that Satan was angry at the Demurge. <laughs> so it is a, um, yeah, and that the Demurge was bad and that he came and he freed man from God's oppressive laws and, yeah, it, it, it goes deep, and um, I think it's more important than you think. So, every Well, I, I don't disagree with you. I was saying I, I think that having laymen or just everybody read this for themselves might not be the best idea because there is a lot of stuff that you have to wade through, and if you're not founded and solid on his word, it can be rather confusing. But you're absolutely right. It is a foundational doctrine of witchcraft. John Todd explained this in his testimonies that Satan, or Lucifer as they call him, because they don't believe Lucifer and Satan are the same, and um, they are progressively lied to in each stage of their uh, hierarchy, if you will. They're never given the truth because he's the father of lies. Just to be clear, he has to pervert everything. But he says that he brought Adam and Eve to the planet Earth on flying saucers to seed the place. The same thing that's in Mormon doctrines, by the way, that he exposed in their actual belief. And that very thing, the idea that they came on UFOs, is in the um, the main Bible for the witchcraft. I can't remember what he called it. It's what the the Book of Shadows is written from, the, ne uh, the uh, Necromonicon. There we go. So all of that ties together with what the adversary is doing. And I actually, it, it is really important. Um, people believe these things is true. And this is a refutation of all of that stuff. Just like everything in scripture refuted the stuff that happened before it happened. The same thing, the more you read this stuff, he literally gave a refutation for every error that's being promoted to this day. Atomic theory is being one of them in the recognitions of clement kepha rebukes that greek philosophy that predated his existence and it was greek philosophy the idea of atoms that's a known fact that we just don't get told anymore but it's known as a scientific theory today and given clout however it says that all things are held together by the word of his power and actual science proves that everything has its own frequency and when you mess with that frequency, it destroys the thing. Something discovered in the 1930s by Royal Redmond Rife. Uh, there's a lot more into that, but I don't disagree with you, sister. I, I, I wanted to just clarify. I think that getting into this before you're solid in what is really true can be confusing for someone. But going through this for anybody to actually learn the nuances of the, the perversions that are actually being taught, it's it's a treasure, right? So, Ob willing, you, you'll, you will all see that this is a treasure in itself, but we'll get back to it. It says, for he, Soter, or the Savior, 
cause such parables to be made after the pattern of things above, as they allege, but the demiurge accomplished the work of creation. For they say that he, the master and creator of the plan of creation, by whom they hold that this world was made, was produced by or from the mother. While the Basora affirms plainly that the word which was in the beginning with Elohim, all things were made, which word, he says, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Which, if you remember, that's even in the, the, the word Mashiach when you dig into it. Yet, according to these men, neither was the word made flesh, nor Mashiach, nor the Deliverer, who was produced from all. For they will have it that the word and Mashiach never came into this world, that the Deliverer, too, never became incarnate, nor suffered, but that he descended like a dove upon the dispensational Yahushua, and that, as soon as he had declared the unknown Father, he did again ascend into the Pleroma. And that's Gnostic opinions again. Some, however, make the assertion that this dispensational Yahushua did become incarnate and suffered, whom they represent as having passed through Miriam, just as water through a tube, but others allege him to be the son of the Demiurge upon whom the dispensational Yahushua descended, while others say again that Yahushua, or while others again say that Yahushua was born from Yahusuf and Miriam, and that Mashiach from above descended upon him, being without flesh and impassable. Yet, according to the opinion of no one, of the heretics was the word of Elohim made flesh. For if anyone carefully examines the systems of them all, he will find that the word of Elohim is brought in by all of them as not having become incarnate and impassable, as is also the Mashiach from above. Others consider him to have been manifested as a transfigured man, but they maintain him to have been neither born nor to have become incarnate, while others that he did not assume man's form at all, but that as a dove he descended upon that Yahushua who was born from Miriam. Therefore Yahu is taught when pointing them all out as false witnesses says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Yahukanon 1.14 This is, and that we may not have to ask, of what Elohim was the Word made flesh? He does himself previously teach us, saying, There was a man sent from Elohim whose name was Yahukanon. The same came as a witness, that he might bear witness of that light. He was not that light, but that he might testify of the light. Yahukanon 1.6 by what Elohim, then, was Yahuchanan the forerunner, who testifies of the light sent? Truly, it was by him, of whom Gabriel is the messenger, who also announced the glad tidings of his birth, who also had promised by the foretellers that he would send his messenger before the face of his son. Malachi 3.1 Who should prepare his way? that is, that he should bear witness of that light in the Ruach and power of Eliyahu, Luke one seventeen, meaning bringing the, heart, the hearts of the fathers back to the son, or sons and the sons back to the father, and proclaiming the name and leading them back from error. If you need to reread the accounts of what Eliyahu did in his ministry, that's what he's talking about. But again, of what Elohim was Eliyahu the servant and the foreteller? Of him who had made Shemaim and earth, 
as he does himself confess. Yahuchanan, the gift of Yahuwah, or, or I'm sorry, the favor of Yahuwah, or Yahuwah has favored. Yahuchanan, right? It says, Yahuchanan, therefore having been sent by the founder and maker of this world, how could he testify of that light which came down from things unspeakable and invisible? For all the heretics have decided that the Demiurge was ignorant of that power above him, whose witness and herald Yahuchanan is found to be. Wherefore Yahuwah said that he deemed him more than a foreteller, Matthew Yahu 11.9, Luke 7.26. For all other foretellers preach the advent of the paternal light and desire to be worthy of seeing him whom they preached. But Yahuchanan did both announce beforehand and in like manner as did the others, and actually saw him when he came and pointed him out and persuaded many to believe in him so that he did himself hold the place of both foreteller and emissary, which is why you don't have emissaries after that time that didn't see and witness in him and proclaim. Just for context there, foretellers before and after, emissaries that witnessed him firsthand. And Yahukinon being the greatest among women, because he was both. And as it mentions, First, right here it says, For this is to be more than a foreteller, because first, emissaries, secondly, foretellers. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. But all things from one and the same Elohim himself. That wine which was produced by Elohim in the vineyard, and which was first consumed, was tov. None of those who drank of it found fault with it. And Yahuwah partook of it also. He, all the places that had the Lord in it, in reference to our Mashiach, I put Yahuwah. Because it, all throughout the renewed covenant, they've done that as well. That doesn't mean that that's the actual word here. It could have been the master. But every one of these taught ones who were taught directly from the emissaries absolutely knew his name was Yahuwah, Yahushua. And it's all throughout the text that they write. First Clement to the Corinthians, the apostolic constitutions against heresies right here. And that's part of the, um, the hiding and tampering and making him unrecognizable was taking his name and replacing it with Baal, right? Or the English equivalent, if you will. But just for complete clarity, this could have been actually what was here, or it could say actually the master just so you know. But this is in Yahuwah partook of it also, but that wine was better which the word made from water on the moment and simply for the use of those who had been called to the marriage. For although Yahuwah had the power to supply wine to those feasting independently of any created substance and to fill with food those who were hungry, he did not adopt this course. But, taking the loaves which the earth had produced, and giving thanks, and on the other occasion making water wine, he satisfied those who were, in, who were reclining, and gave drink to those who had been invited to the marriage, showing that the Elohim who made the earth and commanded it to bring forth fruit, who established the waters and brought forth the fountains, was he who in these last times bestowed upon man or sorry yeah bestowed upon mankind by his son the baraka or blessings of food and the favor of drink the incomprehensible by means of the comprehensible or the invisible by means of the visible sensible okay oh it's right here and the invisible by the visible since there is none beyond him, but he exists in the bosom of the Father. For no man, says he, or he says rather, has seen Elohim at any time, unless the only begotten Son of Elohim, 
which is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. Yahukanon 118. For he, the Son who is in his bosom, declares to all the Father who is invisible. Wherefore they know him to whom the Son reveals him. And again, the Father by means of the Son gives knowledge of his Son to those who love him, by whom also Nathanael, being taught, recognized he to whom also Yahuwah bore witness, that he was a Yisraeli indeed, in whom was no guile. The Yisraeli recognized his king. Therefore did he cry out to him, Rabbi, you are the son of Elohim, you are the king of Yisrael, by whom, and if you recall, look at the original covenant writings, it says in English, you'll find the Holy One of Israel is the king of Yisrael. But when you look in the Hebrew, one of, none of that is in the Hebrew itself. It says Kadosh Yisrael. And that is a title for our Mashiach. And he is the king. He is also the only one as representative of Israel, if you will. Yisrael, the, the one who strives with men in El and overcomes. And he who is a prince of El. He is the one that is the only one that is truly set apart. No one like him in creation. And that's that title. That's what that represents. That's why he is the Israel that we are all to follow and emulate, if you will, in plain English there. <clears throat> but it says, By whom also Kepha, having been taught, recognized Mashiach as the son of the living Elohim, when Elohim said, Behold, my dearly beloved, right, in whom, or my dearly beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. I will put my Ruach upon him, and he shall show judgment to the nations. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoking flax he shall not he quench, or shall he not quench, until he sends forth judgment into contention, and in his name shall the nations trust. I think we've covered that before. But the, the bruised reed is representative of Mitzrayim or Egypt, the reed in which men lean on and trust, and it breaks and goes through the hand. And the smoking flax are the bands that keep the believers. Like You, you see it representative in um, Samson in the time of Judges. So I encourage you to read that story, or both of those accounts. I believe the bruised reed is mentioned by Yeshayahu, or Yirmiyahu in the foretellers as well. <clears throat> it says, Such then are the first principles of the Basora, that there is one Elohim, the maker of this creation, he who was also announced by the foretellers, and who by Moshe set forth the dispensation of the Torah, which proclaim the father of our Yahuwah, Yahushua Mashiach, and ignore any other Elohim or father except him. So firm is the ground upon which these Basora rest, that the very heretics themselves bear witness to them. And starting from these, each one of them endeavors to establish his own peculiar doctrine. For the Ebionites, the poor, right? But they had a peculiar error that they held to. It says, For the Ebionites who use Matith Yahu's Basora only, are confuted out of this very same, making false suppositions with regard to Yahuwah. Yet Marcion, mutilating that according to Luke, is proved to be a blasphemer of the only existing Elohim from those which he still retains. Those again, and this is why I started, I only, whenever people have questions or they, they ask me about things in, in response to scripture, I ask them what they believe to be his word, what they hold to as true, and then I'll use that to, to show them what I believe and why. And after they see it there, I'll show them the other writings that confirm the things that you can find in what they 
know to be true. Same thing with what he does here. You can refute them with the very things they say they believe in. It says, those again who separate Yahushua from Mashiach, alleging that Mashiach remains in pass or remained impassable, but that it was Yahushua who suffered, preferring the Basora to by Mark, if they read it with a love of truth, may have their errors rectified. If they read it with a love of the truth, that it's the only way. And this is why I encourage everyone, read it for yourself. doesn't matter what it is. If people are talking about it, you can't just take their opinion. You got to read it for yourself. He brings comprehension to the heart, right? But we have to not be like ostriches and bury our heads in the sand. It says, those moreover who follow Valentinus, making copious use of that according to Yahuchanan to illustrate their conjunctions, shall be proved to be totally in error by means of this very Basora, as I have shown in the first book. Since then our opponents do bear testimony to us and make use of these, our proof derived from them is firm and true. Kepha does the same thing in the recognitions. He asks right off the, the cusp of it before they begin their disputa disputation together what Simon the Magician holds to. And he makes a very profound statement about regarding what is true through Torah alone. It says, It is not possible that the Basora can be either more or fewer in number than they are. For since there are four zones of the world in which we live, north, east, south, west, and four principal winds, while the assembly is scattered throughout all the world, and the pillar and ground of the assembly is the good news, or Basora, and the Ruach of life. It is fitting that she should have four pillars, breathing out immortality on every side, and vivifying men afresh. Now, the four pillars being the four winds, is also the breath, wind, breath, Ruach, is all the same word in Hebrew which is the connection that he's making right here if you're not familiar, okay? And if you look at the book of Hanok, what comes out of the four winds, the gates that are open that allow them to blow, Baraka or cursing comes from them depending. And that is predicated on the conditions of men in the world. So this is from this, or from which fact, it is evident that the word, the artificer, of all, he that sits upon the cherubim and contains all things, he who was manifested to men has given us the good news or basora under four aspects, but bound together by one ruach. As also Dawid says, when entreating his manifestation, you that sits between the cherubim shine forth. For the cherubim too were four-faced, and their faces were images of the dispensation of the Son of Elohim. For, as the scripture says, the first living creature was like a lion, Revelation 4-7, symbolizing his effectual working, his leadership, and royal power, which the regulus the regal star is the foot of the lion in the constellations. That's where religion, regulations, regalia, all, all those words come from. Regal is the to put your foot, the way you tread, the three the three feasts that they would go to were the the uh, regalia that they kept, if you will. A different way of looking at that, but it's literally where that word comes from. Okay, his leadership and royal power. I was trying to connect the lion with the king, with the first aspect with the book of Yahukanon. Okay, the second was like a calf, signifying sacrificial and kahuna order, but the third had, as it were, the face of a man, an evident description of his advent as a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle 
pointing out the gift of the Ruach hovering with his wings over the assembly. And therefore the Besorah are in accord with these things, among which Yah Mashiach Yahushua is seated between the cherubim here. For that according to Yahukanon relates his original, effectual, and esteemed generation from the Father, thus declaring, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. Also all things were made by him, and without him was nothing made. For this reason, too, is that Besorah full of all confidence, for such is his person. Yet that, according to Luke, taking up his Kohen character, commenced with Zarkariyahu the Kohen, offering sacrifice to Elohim. For now was made ready the fatted calf, about to be emulated for the finding again of the younger son. Matithyahu again relates his generation as a man, saying, The book of the generation of Yahushua Mashiach the son of Dawid, the son of Abraham, and also the birth of Yahushua Mashiach was on this wise. This then is the Besorah of his being man, for which reason it is too that a humble and meek man is kept up throughout the whole Besorah. Prove that. Check it out. Mark, on the other hand, commences with the foretelling Ruach coming down from on high to men, saying the beginning of the Besora of Yahushua Mashiach, as it is written in Yeshayahu the foreteller, pointing to the winged aspect of the Besora. And on this account, he made a, com a, com a compedious and cursory narrative for such is the foretelling character. And that's why it seems different from the other accounts, if you will. And the word of Elohim himself used to converse with the anti-Mosaic patriarchs in accordance with his mightiness and esteem. But for those under the law, he instituted a kahuna and liturgical service. The singers and kohanim that put before him and the means through which he would be contacted at that time, right? In the giving of the Torah, in the instituting of those offerings. Afterwards, being made man for us, he sent the gift of the celestial Ruach, or the Shemaim Ruach, over all the earth, protecting us with his wings. Such then, as was the course followed by the Son of Elohim, so was also the form of the living creatures. And such as was the form of the living creatures, so was also the character of the Besora. For the living creatures are quadriform, and the Besora is quadriform, as is also the course followed by Yahuwah. And again, you can see that course right in chapter 1 of the book of 1st Hanok, foretold on the four ways that he is coming. And it says, For this reason were four principal covenants given to the race of man, one prior to the deluge under Adam, the second that after the deluge under Noah, the third the giving of the Torah under Moshe, the fourth that which renovates man and sums up all things in itself by means of the Besorah, raising and bearing men upon its wings into the Malkuth Shamayim, or kingdom of the heavens. These things being so, all who destroy the form of the Besorah are vain, unlearned, and also audacious. Those who represent the aspects of the Besorah as being either more in number than the aforesaid, or on the other hand, fewer. The former class, that they may seem to have discovered more than is of the truth. The latter, that they may set the dispensations of Elohim aside. For Marcion rejecting the entire Besorah, yea, rather cutting himself off from the Besorah, boasts that he has part in it, or in the good news. Others again, 
that they may set at naught the gift of the Ruach, which in the latter times has been, by the toe of pleasure of the Father poured out upon the race of man, do not admit that aspect presented by Yahukanon's Basora, in which Yahuwah promised that he would send the Comforter, or the Paraclete, right? And that's 14, 16, etc. But set aside at once both the Basora and the foretelling Ruach, something that critical, the higher critics do in everything. Whenever you're reading these older books that are prevalent in the 1800s, which by far are better than the newer versions of these writings that they have on occasion, you're going to find a lot of commentary from higher critics placing the writings at times that would have been explainable for the content in them because they don't believe in foreknowledge. So they, they assume that the people had to have been alive contemporary with those times to write about them in a parable form. This is wretched men indeed who desire to be pseudo-prophets, forsooth, but who set aside the gift of foretelling from the assembly, acting like those who, on account of such as come in hypocrisy, hold themselves aloof from the communion of the brethren, which is why we're told not to forsake the assembly in a, a together of ourselves, right? We must conclude, moreover, that these men cannot admit the emissary Shaul either, for in his epistle to the Corinthians, he speaks expressly of foretelling gifts and recognizes men and women foretelling in the assembly. The book of Acts as well, the apostolic constitutions, there's quite a fit, there's the letters of Clement first and second to on virginity that we have available. All of these talk about how to do foretelling as well. Sinning therefore in all these particulars against the Ruach of Elohim, they fall into the irremissible sin of attributing things of his Ruach to the adversary. They blaspheme against it. Okay. But those who are from Valentinus, being on the other hand altogether reckless, while they put forth their own compositions, boast that they possess more Basora than there really are. Indeed, they have arrived at such a pitch of audacity, audacity, sorry, the Nag Hammadi Library, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of Thomas, all of those Gnostic writings that were found in Egypt that the literal Nicolaitan movement used as their marching orders to amalgamate things. It's literally written to do so. And if you want information on that, you don't have to read it for yourself, but in the course of studying it, it will come up and you will see it for yourself. And then you can have links to study it in depth if you want to. I cannot recommend enough what they call the Antichrist for Dummies on the video or the YouTube channel, christmasisalie.com. Very long series goes in depth about revelation and all of the lies that we've been fed for a very long time and the proper comp comprehension of the events that actually were foretold in revelation and play out through history, starting from before his time all the way to what we're currently living out. The more you look at what the Gnostics did, this stuff right here, then like these events, then you can see what's happening today very clearly and why they're hiding the things that they are. And also, more importantly, the remedy that we must seek to fix it, which is true repentance from our sins and the sins of our fathers. It says, but those who are of Valentinus, on the other hand, altogether reckless, while they put forth their own compositions, boast that they possess more good news than there really are. Indeed, they have arrived at such a pitch of audacity as to entitle their comparatively recent writing, The Gospel of Truth, though it agrees in nothing with the basora of the emissaries, so that they have really no good news, which is not full of blasphemy. For... If what they have published is the good news of truth or basora of truth, 
and yet is totally unlike those which have been handed down to us from the emissaries, any who please may learn, as is shown from the scriptures themselves, that that which has been handed down from the emissaries can no longer be reckoned the basora of truth. This is one of the Nag Hammadi finds, right? The gospel of truth is literally a title of one of the, the books that were found in what they call the Nag Hammadi library, the gospel of Thomas, that says that the, uh, the Ruach is our mother and is Sophia and is sin and the revealer of it and these contrary things. It's, it's really blasphemous evil, but it's the Gnosticism that they promote in those writings that these Gnostics, these Nicolaitans, use as their marching orders to do what they're doing. And it's been like that from time immemorial, the paganism starting in Rome, divination with their ancestors and getting marching orders from demons has been a mantra from its founding. And it's just changed but continues even to this day in that very same way. Because the perversion is always going to be contrary to what is true. It says, sorry, it says, for if what they, or we already had that part. It says, but that these basora alone are true and reliable and admit neither in increase nor diminution of the aforesaid number, I have proved by so many and such. For since Elohim made all things in due proportion and adaptation, it was fit also that the outward aspect of the basora should be well arranged and harmonized. The opinion of those men, therefore, who handed the Basora down to us, having been investigated from their very fountainheads, let us proceed also to the remaining emissaries and inquire into their doctrine with regard to Elohim. Then in due course we shall listen to the very words of Yahuwah. So I think we've gone pretty, pretty bit uh, past our normal time here. So I won't get, oh, that looks like it's the same thing twice. I'm sorry. Either way, I think that covers pretty much what we wanted to. And ob willing, everyone can see the, the patterns, the parables that were laid down as foundational truths all the way from Hanok through to our time, explained in the way that the four good news accounts were given and how that represents the aspects of the, the manifestation of our Mashiach through history to men. Ab willing, everyone will be edified. And if you have any comments or questions or anything, feel free to share in the chat or the comments um, for the video. You all have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and a Shavuot Tov, and we'll see you next time.